Okay, we are still focused on Demaic and in the measurement phase of Demaic. As you remember, um, as we're learning about different skill sets related to Six Sigma, we are really honing in on the common sense aspect of measuring. You can't fix what you can't measure. And so we've spent the past few slideshows on uh, measurement tools defined by the American Society for Quality, ASQ, and today we're going to be talking about Pareto charts because it's another one of these wonderful quality measurement tools that are extremely practical, extremely um, foundational to use. You can do them quite easily, but you can glean a lot of really rich information that can lead into other types of associated measuring that you might want to do so that you can hone in on the best optimum opportunity to improve your um, improve your process. And I just happened to have a great conversation with a friend of mine, Victor Moliel, who is a food safety expert, one of the best in Canada. And he, um, he kept reiterating the fact that we've got all of these really fancy systems and fancy definitions. We really want to hone in on the common sense aspect. And he himself is a scholar of W. Edwards Deming and, and was mentioning how so much of this goes back to common sense and focus. As you remember from our slideshows from Eliehu Goldratt, a lot of it is just focusing in on what is the core problem. These measurement tools are designed specifically to help you identify what is the priority problem and put your attention on fixing that problem. So today, at the end of this video, you will be able to discuss the role of ASQ and standardizing methods of measuring quality. I can't state this enough that there are organizations such as ASQ that have really great frameworks that will help you stay organized. Two, we're going to determine the quality parameters worth measuring for your product or process step and identify when a Pareto chart is the relevant data analysis tool. And Pareto charts work for certain kinds of data and they're relevant for certain kinds of analysis, and for others, they are not relevant. So you need to hone in on the right hypothesis and make sure a Pareto chart's right for you. We're gonna use a Pareto chart for evaluating some data quality and identify trends that we see in Pareto charted data and have a little bit of fun, hopefully, along the way. So, oh, you knew it was coming. W. Edward Stemming says the lack of knowledge. That is the problem, and so keep on learning. And indeed, Con uh, continually finding opportunities to improve yourself is part of that process. Oh, and we get a second quote today, and that would be from Vilfredo Pareto. He was a Italian economist and statistician, and he was uh, one of the uh, founders of the use of statistics as part of sociology. And yes, his concepts were taken over by a wide variety of different political movements in um, early 20th century Europe, including fascists. Um, I am going to bring that up because there's no point in hiding behind it. But he was one of the founders of the uh, principle of using statistics as part of evaluating um, microeconomics and uh, socioeconomics within societies. And so his quote uh, is, human behavior reveals uniformities which constitute natural laws. If these uniformities did not exist, then there would be neither social science nor political economy, and even the study of history would largely be useless. In effect, if future actions of men have nothing in common with their past actions, a knowledge of them, although possibly satisfying our curiosity by way of an interesting story, would be entirely useless to us as a guide in life. And why did I pick this quote from his Cours de l'économie politique? Well, I, I thought it was very interesting that it really is about identifying those patterns. And we brought this up before. W. Edwards Deming says that we're looking at patterns in when problems are occurring and that in many cases, those are common cause errors or common cause variations. And these are manageable within systems in our organization. Using statistics, as suggested by Pareto, 
would be a way of being able to quantify when we're seeing variation in our system and then be able to control for that variation. So uh, Pareto, you may have heard of the 80-20 rule. That's 20% of the effects or 20% of the action within a system causes 80% of the effects. And so that 80-20 rule is often quoted in different business circumstances. It is often quoted in quality circumstances. I don't want to hold hard and fast to it, but I want to consider that the use of statistics used judicially within quality systems allows you to prioritize your attention on the right causes of problems. And so that's why we will be using one of Pareto's analyses, the Pareto chart today. So again, I brought this slide up in many of the past slideshows. We are not just burning toast. We are investigating and measuring when problems are occurring so that we can figure out the actual cause and put our attention on the right solution. So that's going to be our message repeated over and over again. I can't say this enough. Don't just burn your toast. Dig in and understand why the toast is burning and then be able to solve that problem using your good common sense and focus. And do study act. So we are borrowing some tools from ASQ. I noticed this is the wrong slide. It is what is a histogram. Well, under the same slide, they have this resources and they have so many really great learning tools. And I can't say this enough to the students, especially those of you who are at Niagara College. Um, do dig into the resources that are there. ASQ is extremely generous with a wide variety of different templates. And for those of you who are really excited about quality management systems, there are so many different things that you can learn on your own. I'm going to be using their tool, not what is a histogram, but what is a Pareto chart. And I will be mentioning this article, Don't Misuse the Pareto Principle, Four Commons and Mistakes That Can Lead You to the Wrong Conclusions, which is from ASQ's Six Sigma Forum magazine. So at this point in time, I am going to jump out and we're friends, so I'm not going to be shy about doing this and just jump straight to, oh, I've used this check sheet before and I you've seen it before in some of my previous slideshows. Again, this is from ASQ and this is a composite check sheet. The check sheet, as you recall from our previous slideshow, was one of the simplest quality tools and it's as simple as that. You're keeping a tally of the different defects that you're seeing and starting to categorize it. And within there, they do embed a Pareto chart. Let's take a look at this. Actually, I should show you the check sheet just to remind you. We had our mochi factory and we were making mochi ice cream sandwiches. And imagine on the line, the person who's packaging the product is going along and identifying which product has quality defects. Those quality defects are then tallied off in this tally sheet. So we had torn mochi dough and so on. And we just put in a tally on each of the days. And if we click on the Pareto chart here, we can see fundamentally what is in that Pareto chart. I admittedly, I did a little bit of tweaking just to make the axes a little bit easier to read, but more or less, this is exactly what came out of the ASQ table. So what we're seeing here is the torn mochi dough is the most frequent with followed by unsealed mochi dough. And if you really think about it from a root cause analysis, and we will we will talk about root cause analysis in a little bit, but just using our common sense, torn mochi dough, unsealed mochi dough, there's something about the mochi dough from a formulation perspective that is causing it to have machining issues. So is it a formulation issue or is it a aspect of the machine related to the extrusion of that mochi dough? We really need to look at the patterns that we're seeing, but from a defect perspective, that's the most frequent defect. Then we're seeing overweight portions or bubbling in the dough. And this is interesting because again, overweight portions, we're giving away product. It's not necessarily a defect. It's a problem though that uh, from a profitability perspective, we are going to start to see problems. And you remember in our previous slideshow on histograms that uh, we were evaluating the overweight components. The fact that we had overweight, we were able to, by doing a histogram, 
see the spread and distribution of that weight to know that perhaps we had not calibrated the equipment properly and there was being carryover on that product time to time. Bubble on the dough, but note bubble in the dough is not correlating to bubble uh, or bubble in the dough frequency is not correlating to underweight portion. And as we mentioned before in the histogram one, by doing a histogram, a secondary analysis, we were able to identify that we had overcalibrated it. And so indeed, if we had a bubble, the product wasn't necessarily underweight. But a bubble in the dough could be correlated to underweight portion as well. By using this basic Pareto chart, we are able to quickly hone in and say, wait a second, we're losing the most product because of tears and unsealed mochi dough. And using our common sense, we would then turn our attention in R&D and quality management to say, wait a second, why is this mochi dough tearing or not sealing properly? Is it a formulation issue or a machining issue? We could hone our attention in on that rather than just flitting around. Now, let's not flit around here. Let's jump into the other template that ASQ has provided. And this one is strictly for a Pareto chart. And so, again, as I mentioned before, ASQ is extremely generous with a lot of different templates that are available for you online. And for those of you who are in Niagara College's um, course, you can uh, find example templates in there. There are lots and lots of other example Excel templates, but again, I can't stress enough how if you are going into quality management, that starting your career off using some form templates, if you don't have one provided by your, by your company, or maybe you're a startup company and you need to be starting these types of measurements, working with a format such as provided by ASQ, is going to give you a strong sense of confidence about how you're manipulating the data. I am not going to spend time on how did we go about crafting this spreadsheet. There are lots and lots of YouTube videos on how to make a Pareto chart from scratch. I want you to think about the focus on how does a Pareto chart inform your quality management system. So in this case, we took that check sheet, all those tallies, of the different defects that we were seeing and the frequency, the total frequency of each of those different defects that we were seeing. So we pop them in there. And in this case, we don't have to do any sorting. And, and the ASQ table gives you dozens of boxes. So you can find tons and tons of different defects. You could also start to group those defects into subcategories. So I could subgroup that dough or er, piece. I can correlate underweight and bubbling together. That sort of pairing or grouping can become important as you're doing your analysis. Nice thing is that I see this cumulative frequency of the different areas, errors that are being um, identified within my manufacturing, and I can quickly hone in and prioritize. Now, in many cases, organizations will say, well, we're only going to prioritize problems that are causing a certain percentage of the errors that are occurring. You do need to go in and use a lens of logic that in some cases, these are things that could be reworked or mediated. So for example, torn mochi dough, um, it, depending on the situation, you could potentially have someone there who is tucking that mochi dough back in manually. There's a cost to that. Same with the unsealed. You could have someone there who's manually pinching that dough back together. It's a possibility depending on the circumstances. Um, in other cases, you may need to go back and reformulate and do um, some sort of uh, R&D run on that new formulation. Or it could be a fine tuning of the equipment to make sure that it's calibrated appropriately or it's running at the appropriate temperature range for the formulation. In other cases, in the case of food products, some products can be reworked. In other cases, they can't be reworked. In the case of an overweight portion, you're not going to be reworking that. You are going to be selling it as is. It's not illegal to sell more than what's stated on the label. You can't be underweight, but you're giving away product and you're giving away profit when you're giving away. So these are things to consider. Bubbling between the dough 
could be linked to underweight, but we're noticing it's not parallel. And so are we giving away too much product here? Bubbling between the dough, though, could also be a formulation issue. It could be a startup issue when, uh, when you're first pumping product through an extruder, you often have bubbles. Um, and so, again, going back and using these from a prioritization, which of these problems should your R&D and quality team focus on to solve and get the most impact? In this case, you could possibly have a really fast solution for this. Get a, uh, get a uh, line operator down there and pinch those until we have a better solution. You could have an immediate corrective action and then spend more time in the long term reformulating. In other cases, you may be really concerned about the, the scenario, but the main takeaway is use a Pareto chart for prioritization. Now, jumping back, again, we're friends and I'm not going to edit this out. I mentioned how there's a really great article by Adida Bala from Six Sigma Forum magazine, and the article was called Don't Misuse the Pareto Principle. This article you can find online. And again, for young professionals who are interested in learning more, I do recommend the resources at ASQ. Six Sigma Four Magazine is a great one for quality managers to learn more. And a lot of it, as I, as I say in other discussions, reading trade magazines and journals gives you a lot of the vocabulary. And it also helps you identify some of the thought leaders within the sector. So I highly recommend looking up some of these articles. Um, but uh, quoted from that article, they uh, brought up four different scenarios of Pareto chart analyses that could be problematic. And in this case, we've got a flat Pareto chart. Now, the analyses that uh, were done in this case study aren't related to food, but they are still relevant analyses. And in some cases, it is difficult to see within a Pareto chart a clear standout which problem is the most priority. And that's where that grouping or really going back and using common sense makes a lot of sense. In this case, they're looking at a customer service scenario. And why are people complaining about customer service? Is it a response time? Is it unanswered questions? Is it courtesy? And if you look at all of these, you could really hone in and say, it's um, besides response time, much of it comes back to um, employee training. Unanswered questions, lack of courtesy, and are the employees being trained properly? Root cause analysis is the second piece of the puzzle. And you've noticed that so many of these measurement tools from Six Sigma and Demaic are all going hand in hand. The moment that you use one measuring tool that you need to do the second one. In this case, we're seeing some clear aspects behind um, customer training. And so you have to go in and ask why are, why are the employees unable to answer questions? Why are they showing lack of courtesy? And so uh, Ishikawa or root cause analysis is often going to be the secondary one. Main takeaway from this slide is don't be out there expecting that one, one category is going to jump out as causing 80% of the errors. And oftentimes it's a grouping or clustering and you have to think about the root cause and make sure that you're grouping the content in the right categories. Another one is dead end Pareto charts. And then, and this is where it's really not giving you useful information. And in this case, the, the types of questions that are being asked don't really give enough information. Data omission. This is a data entry case study, and they're saying, well, data omission. What was the data that was omitted? What was that piece of information that was overlooked? Asking better questions and giving better characterizations of what the defects are will help hone in on what is the actual problem to be dealing with. If it was a data entry problem in this Pareto chart, 
maybe it's honing in on which of the data boxes was missed the most frequently. And is it missing because it's a user experience or user interface problem with, uh, within the data collection tool? Is it, uh, is it, I don't know, color or font or something that makes it difficult to see and therefore people glaze over it? All sorts of different root causes that could be evaluated by asking better questions and categorizing this better. Third one. Oh, this is one where oftentimes when people are collecting tally sheets for uh, defects, they will often say, well, and we'll make a box for other. And sometimes other ends up being the dominant defect. And in this, in this case study that they're presenting here, other, other participants and other miscellaneous factors were the dominant factors. And how do you characterize that? In many cases, if you start to see a trend analysis that um, people are using other in data collection and not foundationally going in and saying, this is the actual characterization, you've got, you've got to take the time and think really, really carefully that in your data collection tools, you have the right categories and other doesn't give you any information. And in this case, they're mentioning the idea of root cause analysis versus treetop analysis. We will have a slideshow on root cause analysis coming up very, very shortly. And honestly, root cause analysis in a fast and furious summary is, is going in and digging deeper, asking why problems are occurring and really honing in on the whole systems approach until you have really found the problem. And so in this case, they're saying, well, the warp, there was a card warping issue and warping cards were jamming in an ATM transaction. Again, it's not a food scenario, it's a banking scenario, but the key question is, why are those cards warping? Are they warping because the ATM machines are breaking? Are the cards warping because the plastic is poor quality? Are people uh, mishandling their cards and jamming them into wallets or uh, storing them improperly and therefore they need a better storage mechanism? But if, it, if you just go back and report back to your quality team saying the cards warp, End of, end of scenario, rather than digging in and saying why those cards are warping and really honing in on the, the foundation of what is the solution here and asking why, as they say in Ishikawa, ask why five times. If you haven't done that, then that's the big problem. I believe this is my last slide and my phone is ringing. Ah, oh, it is. I'm going to leave you here. I'm going to answer my phone. I always love hearing from you. Take care.